<clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast in uh, this extremely unique and a place that's super close to my heart, Al Ula. And uh, and really, when I think of Al Ula, uh, one person comes to mind. If we had ambassadors, or um, yeah, I mean, I guess ambassadors uh, for cities in in Saudi Arabia. The person in front of me today, Abdul Aziz, uh, would be the ambassador of Lula. So uh, thank you. This is a, a big uh, compliment, and I wish uh, I'm up to this level of confidence. You, you are, you are absolutely. Uh, you know, when the first time I saw you, Abdul Aziz, we were um, we were cruising down one of the streets by the farms, and you were showing my friend and his wife who were on their honeymoon, actually. Yes, right at the end of Corona. Um, when they just went like I think travel just started to open domestically and, and poor guys they 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 you know normally people travel abroad. Or, lucky, or lucky guys or lucky guys you were guiding them around so I had a conversation with you and your English your level of English and 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 uh, ability to articulate things was very very impressive to the point where I asked you I'm like where did you learn English like how did it all come about to you because it was perfect of course well this is one of the benefits of being a Saudi I grew up in this desert uh, I learned English right after high school when I got a scholarship and that's one of the benefits that we had here in the kingdom and we still have uh, big opportunities that takes us outside of the kingdom to get educated to learn the language um, I moved to Canada knowing yes no thank you that's the three words I know if you complete it, if you talk with me a lot, I'll say to you, no English, and I'll walk away and look at us having this uh, conversation in English. It's crazy. You were born in a tent in Al Ula. That's something I remember distinctively when I met you two years ago. Yes. And you lived here up until the age of what? Uh, I lived in the desert the first six months of my life with my grandma, uh, grandmother. Uh, my mother decided to have me in the desert and to have my six months, first six months in the desert with my pa- with her parents. Mm-hmm. And that had a big impact on me, to be honest. Um, I think I, I, I am lucky enough to experience my grandparents living their actual life. My mother and my father living in the desert, learning from them through their actual life, not hearing their stories, you know, seeing it in front of my own eyes. It gave me a big advantage on learning our uh, heritage, our culture, our history. And that's why we are proud of it. I don't imagine that there are many people who would follow your footsteps in, in this day and age. People who spend the first six months of their lives in the desert, away from the townships, small cities. You could be one of the last people who had such an experience. I, I, and I don't think I'm too far off for being naive about that. These days, when you know we towns, uh, if you don't live in a city, you live in a town. Of course, I think it's very rare that people actually call the desert their home in modern day Saudi Arabia. True, and um, so it makes you, it puts you kind of in a in a league of your own type of thing. It makes you very, to be honest, it's a pressure because I learned so much from my parents and my, from my family, especially uh, desert skills and knowledge, which is very important for our day and age. We see people going for a hike nowadays and they feel better just two hours later on, right? There is so much to be learned from the Bedouin that lived in the desert their whole life. Um, their state of mind is so uh, interesting to me. They're always in a peaceful state of mind, whereas us in the cities nowadays are stressed with uh, running after events one after another and never catching up with the world, you know? We always have a fear of missing out, whereas in the desert, they're enjoying the landscape, enjoying the silence, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful experience. You, you know, Aziz, when we were on the way to the train station in Jeddah, we took the train to Medina and from there we drove. On the way to the train station, uh, my manager, the, the manager of the show, Rayan, was like, Mo, uh, what's Al Ula like? I'm like, oh, you've never been? He's like, no, I've never been. I just arrived in Saudi six months ago. I was like, it's the opposite of this. He's like, what's this? I'm like, the traffic that we're in right now. You're on your own, you know. You 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 don't have the millions of people that you're constantly rubbing shoulders with, hustle and bustle of the city, as you say, from one event to another, or work or that. It's peaceful. It's you and and open air. There's something about this place. The energy, the vibe, is different. 
I agree. Is is there what's the what's the secret of 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 al ula and why is the government so keen on wanting it to be the next big thing? Well, al ula is a very special uh, location, uh, and on this entire planet, the history that this the, this location holds is very special, and what makes um, our government focuses on such locations is because they know the value of it for humans, for us, for everybody. And it's such an inspiring location to start uh, a project like Al Ula in. Uh, Al Ula project is it's not just uh, making this uh, desert a uh, touristy destination. No, it's a place where we show the whole planet that we can celebrate art and history and heritage in a, a deserted location that has that is full of history, human history. I'm talking five thousand, six thousand years old of human history all around us here. Now, all this history and all these people and knowledge that passed through here left an energy in the place. And you can feel it as soon as you arrive to Al-Ula, you feel that kind of something interesting, something new. The human before us did the same thing. But the main thing that brought him here back in the day was the source of water and food and also safety. Being inside these valleys, it's protect us from the wild animals from so much. That's why it's a very special location. And the RCU, they understand the value of it and they're trying to show the world the value of this location by opening it up for the world and allowing everybody to come in and experience it themselves. Yeah. And if you notice, um, RCU developed a cool uh, concept for Al Ula and it's called Experience Al Ula. And this is a touristic uh, website of Al Ula that shows you all the th- things happening in Al Ula. And I love how they went about it. It's Experience Al Ula. And every time you come, you experience something new. Everywhere you go, you experience something new. It's built around experiences. And this is just the start, I think. It's unbelievable. You know, I, I said uh, a couple, no, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, in one of the earlier podcasts, uh, uh, a Paris's podcast, actually. I was like, I, I bet you in three to five years, we'll have direct flights from Europe. And that happened in a year and a half. Look at that. Yeah. Paris to Al Ula is yes. now a service that's offered a few times a week. True. <laughs> and and who's to say what other destinations are we talking far east because you have people from china japan they're sick of their cities they wouldn't be interested in riyadh or jeddah no they want to see this they want to feel like they're on another planet i, I mean agree. my goodness it feels like we're on mars it's true something about true especially for the people that are well traveled they have seen everything they have experienced everything they always go for something unique and i believe the kingdom is a unique destination Al Ula is a very unique destination, and for everybody, there is something for them in Al Ula, yeah. and that's what makes a place very special place. Uh, last time I came, two years ago, I went on the hot air balloon. Mm. It really, I mean, it uh, just looking at it from the top there is a whole is a whole different experience, as you know. Beautiful. Experience. I know you're big on your drones. Yes. Just getting those shots yes. from up there, yes. it's yes. it's next level. Yes. And this year I went zip lining. Mm. I'm like, there's these different activities that pop up left, right, and center. What else can people expect in Al Ula in terms of activities? Uh, interesting things and new things. Um, RCU is developing Al Ula in a beautiful way. And that's why they divided this year the celebration, the festival, into different parts where we celebrate the heritage and the history. And now we are in the art and culture. And it's a very beautiful uh, installations of Desert X and all the surrounding art installations. And later on, the Sky Al Ula, which is a beautiful experience that they have developed to show you this amazing landscape that we are in from, an, uh, from the sky to see what we are in when we are sitting between these mountains. Mm-hmm. And it's a fascinating uh, landscape for sure from the sky. Uh, you know, some of these art pieces that you see scattered around, like if you just go up there, make left tw- towards Habitas Hotel, you'd see like 200 different colored balls just scattered all over the place. Uh, Mariah, that building, looks like it fell from the sky. Uh, I'm, I'm super proud of Mariah and the construction of Mariah. I mean, uh, we have a beautiful thing, which is nature. Uh, everybody knows it. We see it in front of our own eyes. But if I told you, come and develop this area, you probably have the biggest challenge is how can I develop without hiding this beauty? How can I build with it? So Mariah is an uh, iconic uh, building, and I love how we went with building with nature. From a distance, you can never notice Mariah. From near of Mariah, the vision is not blocked. You still see what's behind you. 
And that's a beautiful architect, reflecting the beauty as opposed to uh, trapping or being an obstacle exactly. to to nature. Exactly. It's all. It's a glass. We'll put a picture of it uh, on on screen right now yeah. for those watching on YouTube. Uh, it's it takes. It's a it's it's a music hall. Like it's an events hall that takes what a thousand people. Uh, a thousand five hundred. A thousand five hundred yes. people. Yes. And they have a beautiful uh, restaurant on top, Mariah Social. Okay. Um, and they host a lot of interesting events there, and that's what makes the place a very special uh, place. They held um, the golf summit in it a while ago. And it's a beautiful location because I see the impact of it on the artists that come to perform. Mm -hmm. you, you feel, you see them, you see the wow factor in their eyes. You see them inspired to produce something beautiful. We have a lot of uh, international artists coming back every, every year for Ula for that special feeling they felt yeah. here. And the singer Bocelli, I think he's like a headliner, resident. Every musician. Year. I mean, uh, I hope soon we see him finding a home and living with us here, man. It looks like he, he belongs here for sure. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. You just look at some of the restaurants that have uh, opened here. Uh, every year they add a couple more to it. Uh, options of, uh, of of eating, events. There's a polo game going on right now. We actually just came from there. Yes. Um, with all that's changing here. You're a local. You you know you you have your pulse on how the locals feel about all those changes. Mm. Are the majority of them happy, or are there some who you know miss the days of yesteryear, or or, or most of them happy I'll with the tell change? You, I'll tell you how it is. We used to uh, finish high school and go to Jeddah or Riyadh or whatever to get our education. Later on, we get hired in a job in Jeddah or Riyadh or Dammam or whatever it is. So we come to our family once or twice a year based on our holidays. Now, nowadays the opportunities are here. Now, even the people that have left and worked abroad are coming back. So you can imagine how the families feel. And it's always a beautiful feeling to be home and having opportunities home and to be surrounded by your family and fr your friends. Yeah. So the majority of people are benefiting from here. The, the kind of jobs and opportunities that we have here, it's like nowhere else. Yeah. And there is a, an emphasis on the local. And this is what I love about uh, what RCU is doing. They're developing the land by developing the human in the land to take care of that land after they develop it. And that's why we have a scholarship for the Ula community now. And it's a beautiful uh, opportunity for them to experience what I experienced through the scholarship of uh, the program of King Abdullah. Um, oh, you, you went on yes. the King Abdullah scholarship yes. to Canada? Yes. So it was a beautiful experience. Okay, if fun. I if I can relive it again, I would. I would recommend everybody to go through it. Uh, we learn so much through it. But the most important thing that I have learned through that experience is what makes us as, as special is being us, being Saudis. Yeah. You are from the West, I'm from the East, from the North, from the South, and being proud of what we have. This is what makes us special, you know? Going abroad uh, exp exposes you to a lot of cultures, a lot of things, and you kind of know your space within this planet, within this world. Mm -hmm. And you'll know your values, you'll know the things that you should be proud of. And we have so much to be proud of. Truly. truly. Culture-wise, country-wise, community-wise, nation-wise, history-wise, there is so much to be proud of. And it's so great to be a, a young Saudi nowadays. Yeah, it is. There is such a great buzz in the air. And you see, you look around, you're like, wow, this everything that we see around in activities and restaurants and attractions and art and polo and hotels. And this is just all four or five years old. Yeah. Minus two years from Corona. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's unfathomable. It's it's undersaturated like for investment opportunities for hotels that Habitat's just open, 100 rooms. I tried to book there this weekend. It's full. It's full. Yeah. Exactly. Banyan Tree next door. I don't know how many rooms, but full. Full. Exactly. We stayed in this place by, by the airport, decent accommodation. Mm. Um, but it tells you that there is there is a high demand for this place already. Exactly. Because the, the secret of Lula is uh, building the experiences right. They play on a lot of elements. One of them, the visual. That's why you see the art installations alongside this beautiful landscape that we have. They play the hearing. That's why we have a lot of, uh, host a lot of great artists in Lula. They play on the taste element of our senses. Mm. That's why they bring a lot of cool cuisines and restaurants. So, and, and they, they design the experiences based on what makes the human love this place. Yeah. And you can feel it on everybody that comes here. 
I'm a big fan of the artist that is playing tonight. I can't believe she's here. Yes. Like I always thought for the longest time, early 2000s, I was like, she's the best singer in the world. No one's like her. Like her voice is on another level. Alicia Keys. I agree. Like I can't believe I'm going to her performance slash concert tonight. In the middle of the desert. In the middle of the desert. In a place we didn't know about a few years ago. Isn't that just crazy? You know? And that's, that's the beauty about what we are going through. We are going through a transformational era all over the kingdom. But at the moment, what the kingdom is doing is just putting a, a flashlight on certain spots of Saudi. We see Al Ula, we see Neum, we see the Red Sea project, we see in the south, the Suda, and other parts like Giddiya, Dri'iya. It's all developed you know, at a different timing, but it's all connected to the big picture of what we are trying to do here. Al Ula is not a place that we run it for a touristy events and that's it, we leave it, no. Uh, the RCU is developing something very unique here for the rest of the planet to learn from. How can we take this beautiful place and develop it while being aware and conscious about our impact as a human on this planet? How can we leave something for the people that comes after us on this land and appreciate what we left? And that's what RCU is doing and that's why I'm super uh, happy to see them really caring about the most precious thing that we have, which is our nature. Yeah. It's fascinating. It really Definitely. is, Annie. You know, you gotta you gotta take your hat off to them because it's it's not an easy job to to kind of build from scratch. Essentially, all, what they did at all. But but you know what they what the case is now. Like what the the, the fact of the matter is now mm. is that people believe, like Saudis beyond Saudi people believe that, oh shit, Saudis for real. You know, like it's it's not just a, a couple of pictures. No, 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 no. We are we're we're, we're really serious about this. No, there is no joke about uh, Fiji in 2030. We at the beginning thought, oh, it would take so long for it to, to, to come to life. But after a few years of doing hard work, we think, oh, well, it's sooner than when, sure. what we thought. You know, it's really sooner than um, what a lot of people expected. Um, and it, this is just the beginning. And what I love about what we have in the kingdom at the moment is we are relying on the expertise and knowledge that we bring from outside as well. Yeah. In the Royal Commission of Al-Ula, they're, they're partnering up with a French company to develop Al-Ula and bring expertise to Al-Ula. Uh, in Neum, they're, they're developing and, and building with, with a lot of international players. So we can learn from the mistakes that people made in the past when it, they tried to develop their areas and improve on it and bring that knowledge and expertise and implement it in the local community. And that's how we can guarantee it will be a sustainable project in the future. I should have asked you this earlier, but what is your normal day like? Do you do you re, do you work for a company? Are you a freelancer? Like, take us through what a normal day for Aziz looks like. Okay, well nowadays it's a bit different, you know. But uh, my profession, I own a studio in Al Ula called the Nabati In Studio. We produce content for brands, international brands here in Al Ula, anywhere, uh, anything you can think of. We collaborate with big brands uh, to showcase their product here in Al Ula. Also, we cover events that happens in Al Ula. But my main uh, purpose uh, here is to develop the artistic community in Lola, especially uh, people that look at me and they think, oh, this is a cool thing I want to be doing, which is uh, creating content, which is a beautiful thing. We have a beautiful landscape. We have beautiful history. We have a lot of great stories to be told. We really need to know, learn how to use these uh, tools to tell our stories in a better way. And uh, our my daily routine uh, is no routine. And I learned that from my gra my uh, Bedouin family, actually. Wake up every day, there is no stru structure to their day. From this time to this time, I do this and that and that. You know? I love that. Can I move in with you guys? Come on. I mean, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the future. The future is not uh, being stuck in a box from nine to five. The future is being around in, in spaces like this to allow it to impact you so you can produce amazing work that people can look at and say, oh, this is an amazing work, you know? And there is so much to be uh, gained and learned from nature. And that's what I spend, where I spend most of my time in. For sure. Yeah. You know, I feel like the freer you are, the better the quality of work you'll do. Mm -hmm. When you are one at, when you are with one at nature, when, uh, you are doing something that you enjoy on your own time, on your own schedule. If you can find a way to do it, you'll do your best work when you I work agree. from the heart. I agree. You know, at your own I pace, agree. as opposed to being told what to do. I agree. Building someone else's dream. True. 
100%. It worked for some people, to be honest. Uh, not all of us has to be starting our own thing. And sometimes being the f- number one is not what suits you best. It could be You could be better at number six in a company or uh, number 20 or 100. Yeah. You could be happier there. But the secret is doing what you enjoy doing every day, not for the money, but because you feel you want to do it. Yeah. And that's where you become, uh, you enter a state of flow where you produce things according to how you feel and how you want to feel, you know? And that's what brings great work, you know, feeling the inspired to create this or do that or collaborating here or there. Mm-hmm. The the pressure of, of working a nine to five occupies your mind to be aware of where you are. If you are calm, quiet, aware of where you are, you'll notice the opportunities and you'll take better care of them. Whereas if you are busy and I put you in place full of opportunities you'll never notice them because your mind is running from one thing to another and that's the, th- the beauty of of nature and what i feel the future of saudi is is us going into nature and building our homes and studios and work and companies in nature my studio is not a place you see on the street it's in a farm <laughs> i imagine that it'd be your typical last uh, you know so and and open air open air wow. open air yes uh, send, I, us, send us some pictures when you get a I chance. Will, we'll put it on this uh, episode. Yes, yes, please. And and my whole idea is we tried as a humanity. We tried in the past doing normal things the way we think normal is. But normal is not uh, what we should be striving for. We should be striving for abnormal, things that makes us feel good, do good things, you know. And that comes from outside the box. Our family lived in nature their entire life. And they produced amazing work that is being written about in Europe and everywhere else. The Bedouin that left Rome this desert, they lived in nature and they produced amazing work, whatever their work was, you know. So nowadays our job is not to go to the cities and ruin what is beautiful there. Our job is to use that city whenever we need it because a city energy is a beautiful energy. Nature energy is beautiful, but you can be here and there and moving around, you know. And that's where you notice the difference of things, you know. Nature's energy is better than city energy, for sure. I've tried both. They, 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 they teach you about each other energy. You know, if you are in nature only, you'll never know what the city is. And if you are in the city only, you sure. never know what the energy of, of nature is. Whereas if you see here and there, and every city of Saudi has an energy to it. For sure. Riyadh is special, Jeddah, Sharqiyya, South, mm. North, every city is unique. Definitely. It's a continent, huh? يعني من جد بحجم قارة. Uh, totally. And uh, Corona taught us so much about our kingdom. Taught us so much about us. We traveled uh, locally here, domestically, and we learned about each other. Yeah. We learned about the different cultures and the different uh, things and way of living that we do as uh, Saudis here. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Is there something that you would like to? see in terms of an addition to al-ula, a change or an addition or anything out there that you're like, yes, you know what, we need that over here. Anything out there? To be honest, I'm loving everything that we are doing. And I, they expect, uh, they, ex- uh, they exceeded expectations. They have done things that we thought it's not possible. So whatever they are w- doing, it's working beautifully. Mm-hmm. And we see the results of all the hard work that have been done in the desert. They spent a lot of time on master plan just to make sure not to do things and regret it in the future. True. So for sure what they are doing, whatever they're doing, it's amazing. They're activating Al-Ula in a beautiful way. Al-Ula is not a place where you want it to be crowded and it loses its its value. Yeah, it's true. You want it to activate it in a gentle way yeah. with the, all these gentle events happening around. Definitely. You just when well, next time you you know happen to find yourself in a board meeting with RCU or or come across someone from there, uh, maybe you can slip this idea. It came to me when I went up in the balloon, mm. and I was like, mm. "Wow, from up here, it's a different vantage mm. point. It looks different." Mm. Skydiving. It's coming. It's coming. Yes. <laughs> so wh- who am I to think of something that, <laughs> that they didn't think of? <laughs> of course. I could just. I, I mean, I can't even imagine how of course, beautiful. Just of seeing course. that beyond <sighs> beyond imagination. Wow. The experiences are developed around the senses. One of them is the visual. In the visual, we can do so much with it. On the ground and above. Yeah. On the ground, it's an experiences and above. 
is an additional experience. Totally. And there is so much to be done above. And I'm, I love the sky uh, activations because it has low impact on our planet. It has low impact on nature. That's true. L- low footsteps of, of humans around. You know? Interesting. So that's a beautiful uh, way to experience the country we live in. Because when you go on these 4x4 ATVs, they're loud, they pollute, they ruin the landscape. Eventually, like with wind, everything changes. Yes. But I see what you mean. Sky activations are uh, yeah, a lot less detrimental to the planet than True. on ground. I've True. never thought of that. And you want to go through the experience in silence as much as you as you can. Yes. That's where you feel the experience. Yeah. If you are in a loud environment, you'll never connect. It unless I'm playing something I want you to feel. Yeah. You know? Sure. So the beauty about the air balloon, it's a slow and gentle and it takes a while. And it allows you to connect with the silence and it allows you to observe things around you from the sky in a quiet air balloon, nobody with you, you know. So it's a definitely beautiful experience. We, we, we live in a world where almost every activity requires sound or an engine. Or, you know, how many people go sailing compared to a speedboat? 99% are on a speedboat. You go on, when, you go on a, when you go on a sailboat, it's a different vibe. True. It's amazing. And you're True. right. When I went up in the air balloon, I was like, why am I really enjoying this? Mm. Because all I could hear was just my breath. Yes. You know, maybe the odd bird. Yes. But that's it. Yes. It's yes. Different. Yeah, and above different. this amazing landscape. I mean, the mountains in Saudi are so unique from the sky. Here in Ula, we have volcanic mountains. We have white volcano, which is very rare in the world. We have areas that are covered with lava and you can see it from the sky. Wow. We have areas that the mountains that we have here, which is red and sandy uh, rocks. We have volcano. We have other kind of rocks that reddish. So the landscape from the above is so fascinating. It's a beautiful picture drawing by by God, you know. Subhanallah. And it allows us to feel them and appreciate them from the sky. Aziz, you'd be able to answer this question. Is it true that many thousands of years ago it was underwater? Yes. There, there was all yes. water here. The geologist uh, proved that. Yes. So that's what. That's why we see such incredible. I mean, every time I look at it, it just takes my breath away. Yes. That's why the formation yes. looks like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and with the with the work uh, the miracle work of sand and uh, air and wind, it allowed this beautiful uh, mountains to be shaped this way. This way. So when we drove from Medina to Al Ula last night, me and Rayan, um, we ended up taking a road that I haven't taken before. There's three ways to get here from Medina. Mm. I have taken the first two. I did not take this last one. I'm mm. trying to see what the best way to get here is. Mm. And then we got on a call with uh, a, a guy from Medina, and he asked us, which road did you take? We told him we took left after Khaybar. He's like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> I was like, what you, what, why? Well, you know, I, I watch too many horror movies to hear mm. that line, you don't want to do that. He's like, you, you know, you don't want to do that. First of all, it's dark and uh, stuff happens. Like, what do you mean stop? He's like, first of all, don't stop for anyone. Any hitchhikers, anyone that says stop, do not stop. I'm like, fine. I'm like, what else? He's like, other things. It's like, like what? He's like, spirits and mm-hmm. ghosts. And I'm like, oh, I was fine with the hitchhiker, you know, <laughs> but not, not with that. Is this area notorious? Does it have a reputation for having spirits, you know, jinn? Have, have you had any experiences? With well, uh, why do you think it's well preserved? Because of these legends. It scared some of the people away. Some of them are real, some of them are not. But they coexist with us and they are all around us. And even now? Even now. And they are even in the historical uh, sites with a lot of rituals on them and a lot of uh, things that have done in these locations. And they coexist in this location with the human for a very long time. Now, there is some incidents where people like got exposed to them or interacted with them or experienced things around them. But there is nothing to be scared of. We coexist. We know this in Islam that they are a part of this planet with us. Yep. Mentioned in the Quran a lot. Yes. <clears throat> but when it comes to legends, we have so many legends around that stories, around uh, spirits uh, and their uh, existence here as well. So is, is that the reason why the civilization that used to live here no longer live here? the spirits drove them out or not n- doesn't have to be that way they don't always uh, drive people out uh, there is a lot of reasons that's why al died after its glory 
it used to be one of the main uh, cities of planet Earth, how we think of New York now and Paris and all of these locations. Back in the day, this region used to be a very famous location for any human to come here and see the work of Hegra and the tombs, you know, structured this way. It's a very eye opening for them as well. So it was a, a city developed well with the money of the caravans and, and the commerce passing through here. And later on, people uh, really thought uh, developing is uh, going to the cities. That's where the oil is. That's where the the, com the big companies is. And people slowly, gradually left this deserted area to go look for opportunities. You know, you must come across gems, perhaps stuff that is undiscovered in your travels, in in, you know, in your walks and through nature. I know that the old civilization, this, you'll find a lot of their communication on the red rocks with their, you know, yes. sculptures yes. Or, or whatever. Yes. Do you, have you come across some interesting artifacts? Yes, definitely. Uh, all these mountains of Lula are filled with information and knowledge that are being transferred through times to us. In every corner of Lula, of these mountains, you'll find inscriptions. Some of them dates back really to six, five thousand years old. Some of them are recent, 2,000, 3,000 years old. And each tells a story. Some of them are describing a scene. Some of them are re uh, religious rituals. Some of them are um, uh, asking things from their gods. Uh, some of it is beautiful artwork that you see it and you get inspired by it and think that, okay, Bedouin nomads have done this thousands of years ago with no opportunities, with no support, with nothing of the things that we have nowadays. What can we do? They are, uh, our ancestors have done this with no support at all. What can we do with the support that we have nowadays? Yeah. We can do so much. And the resources, it's endless. And the support, which is the main <laughs> The support, of course. That's what allows us to be where we are, you know. And the beautiful thing about the kingdom nowadays, there is an emphasis on us, young Saudis, girls and boys that trying to do something, trying to be something, trying to find their space within this whole planet that we are in. And the kingdom is not only opportunities for us, it's for the foreigners as well. We have friends that are happy to be here. Mm -hmm. We have friends that outside the kingdom that are dying to come and visit and live and to work with us. Yeah. So that's the beauty secret sauce that we have at the moment. And I hope we make a better use of it, you know, and we impact the planet around us as well. Really well put, Aziz. Really, really well put. Yeah. I agree with every point you said. We spoke a lot about RCU and what they did. Uh, mashallah, endless work. I know Ministry of Culture. They they also have a lot of efforts to put into Al Ula. Uh, what kind of uh, let's say fingerprints uh, have you seen of Ministry of Culture in the Al Ula region? Uh, the Ministry of Culture are a big part of what's happening in Al Ula. They are overseeing all the art art installations and all the fashion things recently. Doja and Gabbana did the show here. That mm. was through them, organized through them. So they're behind the arts that yes, we see. Yes, yes. Okay. And their team is working closely with RCU, with, with them to develop this area and preserve the culture and the history and, and the heritage that we have here. And they have, they have been doing amazing work. And the most amazing work is coming from the head of Ministry of Culture, His Royal Highness Prince Badr uh, Al Saud. He's the governor of Al-Ula. He's the guy that's really invested in Al-Ula when it comes to culture as well. And he makes sure, Al-Ula is very close to him, to his heart as well. And he always makes sure that all the activations that happens here happens within the guidelines of the Ministry of Culture. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to develop an area and it loses its culture and, and heritage. You want to develop it but by shining and, and putting a spotlight on what makes it unique, truly. Uh, our season called Winter at Tantora. This is a cultural uh, festival. The idea is, is smart to celebrate this region through its culture. Tantora is a very important element in our culture. It's, um, it's been used by farmers to know when to grow their, their, uh, uh, their farms and when to harvest as well. So it's a very important element for the culture of the region and to see the name of the festival after it is such an inspiring moment. Is that January? 
Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, end of uh, December. End of December. Yeah. Okay. And it runs until? Until end of March. Oh, until it was. Yes. So, so we, we're currently in the Thunder. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And they're doing a lot of uh, great work. Uh, we've seen at the polo, uh, some people dressing in a Saudi traditional way. Mm-hmm. And it's all because of the hard work the Ministry of Culture is doing, activating all these events around the kingdom, encouraging people to dress traditionally and to be proud of their traditions. And we see a lot of uh, Saudi brands as well that are amazing when it comes to uh, fashion as well. And they're making a name internationally as well through our heritage, through our culture. You know, I just want to go back to when you said um, back in the day, you and people that lived in Al-Ula used to go to the major cities to look for job opportunities. Do you know how many people I know from Jeddah are working here now? Amazing. It's it's flipped. <laughs> the roles have reversed. Who would have thought, though? I mean, so many opportunities came up here that people left the cities that have five and six million where all the opportunities are, and they and they uh, they left their families the way you, you left your family, and they're coming here. Isn't it ironic how the tides have, have changed. It is, and that's the benefit of putting a spotlight on the desert. All the jobs and opportunities go there, so we are going towards it in general. Yeah. But this should teach us something that if, if there is opportunities here, there's opportunities everywhere. Exactly. Everywhere. Not only in the city. True, true. And to be honest, there's more opportunities here and better opportunities in nature and outside of the cities than in the, in the city. Because in the city, I'm competing with everybody. Everyone. Yeah, it's saturated. And in nature, whether you are like me, somewhere, someone uh, that's born in a small town in Saudi, and you're thinking, uh, I have to move to Riyadh or Jeddah to find work or opportunities. No, think outside the box. Think what you can add to the whole thing that we're going through. Tourism is a beautiful industry because it brings money to the pocket of the people, wherever the people is. If you have a farm, develop it. If you have a tent with your Bedouin family, develop it to host people. If you are passionate about art, you can go create art, pictures, videos, whatever it is. Just find the things that you love and enjoy and be in an area that people are interested in. Post pictures on social media. People will come to you wherever you are. Yeah. Because we're, again, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a unique thing. People uh, around the world, the majority of them all live in houses or mm. apartments. Mm. So to see someone who lives in a desert or, or in a tent or, you know, in a, in a subtle type of housing, it's it's different and it's unique and it'll attract people. It'll attract eyeballs as well. 100%. I have so many people are requesting uh, a visit to my Bedouin family who still live in the desert. And be like, we want to be with them or they want to stay for two days, three days with them. Now, when I go to my family and I tell them this, they, they're laughing. They're like, okay, we never thought they, were, they would want to come and live our life. And I'm like, no, it's an opportunity. And now it's inspiring to see the, the young kids thinking, oh, maybe there is an opportunity for me here. And they're trying to be tour guides and they're trying to do things within their community, you know, to serve the, the tourist that comes here to experience things with us. Yeah. Definitely. It's a simple life, you know, like if, if I leave, um, you know, home for a couple of days, it's an adjustment. Even if I'm going to another city in Saudi, if the pillow is not the same, if the water that I is not the same. Yes. But if you live in the desert, you are just constantly adapting. It's just so amazing, you know, I, I, I take my hat off to people that need very little to survive. And if you are the kind of person that lives in a tent, if I didn't like this area today, pack up, let's go a couple kilometers that way. It's a different view. I don't need that much to survive. I have my dates, I have my camel milk, I have whatever I need over here. I don't need all the things that us humans think we need in 2022. We don't even need 90% of what we think we need. I agree. Uh, Being in the desert teaches you to be content with whatever you have and resourceful resourceful, and being uh, grateful for everything that you have because you have a limited of everything. But uh, go back to the um, contentment uh, phase and feeling. It's beautiful to be in nature with nothing and feeling that I'm not missing on anything. I don't need anything. We need water. We need food but we don't need a lot of them. We don't need the phone. We don't need the internet. We don't need the electricity. What we need is to exist and to appreciate being existing in, in this era with a conscious of, I am alive and that's enough. That's enough blessing to be grateful for, you know? 
and I'm alive, young, healthy, um, in this amazing landscape, there is so much to be, you know, learned from it. Now take that mindset uh, and bring it to the city, you will do magic with it. Yeah. But it's hard to have that mindset in the city. You're always, you know, on 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 the go. Your your mind is busy. There is so much happening. You always fear of missing things. You're used to luxury, uh, comfy bed. You're used mm. to so many things. You think you crime, need. crime. It's high. Yep. It's high. It's crazy how I leave my car open, and some of my friends visiting me from the desert, uh, from the city, is telling me, "Oh, did you lock my car? I have everything in." I'm like, guys. <laughs> We're hiking this mountain. We'll come back to our car. It's so safe. You know? Yeah, the spirits will take care of it for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet your immune system, your health, and life expectancy is probably higher. I, I only think I'm gonna we're gonna look this up. I bet you it's higher in for those who live outside in small towns than those who are in the stress of the city pollution. Uh, you just live a cleaner life out here. Bottom line, I mean, that's 100 percent. My grandmother is uh, above uh, 90 years old. Mashallah. Allah 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 Allah. She lived for 75 years in the desert. So sitting with her, I'm experiencing something that not a lot of people experience. I see a person that spent all her life in nature, which is the opposite of what we are used to, you know. And to be honest, her health is not as well now that she moved in the city with us. She's staying in the town of Ulula. She prefers being outside. Of course she does. And looking at her lifestyle in the city and outside, I know why she feels better in the desert. She's moving around, she's geared up, she sees nature, she sees her animal around her. She walks a lot. She does so many things in fresh air, in the sun. Whereas in the city, it it is not designed for a human to grow and to prosper. So you can feel her health is not as well as it's used to and that's when we take her to the desert again for two weeks three mm. weeks we she can't just to again. give her that yeah. feeling again you know yeah. you know um rugby teams football teams uh in, before seasons start they do a lot of training on the beach and sand oh wow so now just think of you or your family walking in sand how much more challenging it is against walking on asphalt in oh the city look what it's doing to your leg muscles and this is just something just right off the top of my head. Climbing the, whole, the mountains. Climbing the yes. mountains. You know, yes. like uh, they say, never, never, never skip leg day in the gym. <laughs> you're doing leg day every day every when you're out day, in the really. hiking, of course. Totally, totally. Health-wise, being in nature is so healthy for a human. Um, for our spirit, for our physical as well. Mm. Uh, it's a very important element. And the lifestyle in nature forces you to exercise and to walk yeah. and to mm -hmm. use the the gift that you have, which is the body. Body, yeah. yeah. Um, you guys, get, it gets cold, it goes below zero here, right? Yes. And, and we're still in the middle, smack in the middle yes. of winter. Yes. And in summer times, it, 40 cents Celsius yes. max. Yes, okay. uh, it gets 45 sometimes. Dry. Summer is, yes, very dry heat, uh, hot, but the desert can get really cold as well. Yes, like yeah, right it's, now. It's not uh, actually um, an hour and away from here. Okay, north? Two weeks ago, yes, okay. northwest. Wow. And to see snow. First near time Lula. you see it in this area? In this area. It used to fall five hours away from Lula. Mm -hmm. Now it's an hour and a half. That's crazy. So it's getting closer and closer. Yeah. Who knows? Well, maybe one day we have snow here. Who, who knows? Setting, it's you know? a ski resort and all of these. Really, really. <laughs> well, Aziz, man, what a yeah, and a unique conversation. Honestly, it's uh, it's been so. I know we've been wanting to do this episode for a long time, um, but just hearing your story, I think a lot of people are going to find. It's interesting for the same reasons that I found it interesting because your background is a lot different to the majority of the people that have come on the show. Actually, I don't think any of them ever lived in a tent. So uh, especially to the foreign foreigners uh, who, who are listening, who want to know more about Saudi, you know, we, 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 we naturally make our assumptions on people. Uh, this person, like the, well, the first time when I saw it, I was like, mashallah, his English is incredible. Yeah. So just people hearing your story in a language that they understand is really one of the main reasons why I started this podcast. Access from people all over the world to someone who lives in Al-Ula with a, with a background similar to yours. It's it's really unique, man. And I really appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. I, re I really appreciate everything you are doing. You are an amazing person. And uh, what you are doing, it's such an amazing thing. It, it's such an honor to be sitting in front of you, man. And, and the kind of things you're doing, 
it's fascinating and I'm super proud that I can call this podcast a Saudi podcast. Habibi, that means so much to me, honestly. Really, really nice words that you're saying. Is there something that you want to uh, put out there before we say uh, yeah. Before we say we're too cold, definitely we are. We are getting cold in the desert. It's so cold. I I, I love it, but I yeah. need another layer. For you from Jeddah though, so yeah, it, it gets really colder for you. You know, I, yeah. I can handle it a little bit. Yeah. But uh, anything I can say, it's uh, we are blessed to be in the kingdom at the moment. We are in a beautiful uh, country with uh, a great vision. Uh, the majority of us are young. We are open to the world. We are well traveled. We speak the language of the world. We are unique being Saudis. We were close to the world for so long. There's so many advantages of being a Saudi. And my advice is let's take good care of this advantage. Let's take good care of the opportunities around us. In every city, there is an opportunity. If you are a young guy or girl, you don't know how to do or to be a part of this. Just volunteer, work for the event, the small event, the big events. Work for the, this, these big companies, RCU, Royal Commission of Al-Ula, Neom, Red Sea Project. They're doing big things for this uh, uh, country that we are in. And our job is to be good at we are, what we are good at, whatever it is. Just be good at it, produce amazing work. The support is ours, the opportunities is ours. We just need to be aware of them. Yeah, That's a big takeaway from this episode honestly, uh, which is there are opportunities everywhere. You just Beyond imagination. Yeah. Be, I, I really thought at the beginning that the opportunities are only on Al Ula, but I have met guys from the South as well. Yeah. There is opportunities yeah. everywhere. I met a guy in uh, Faifa Mountain. He's developing an Airbnb business there. He's doing well. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, you know that your grandfather used to travel and they traveled to Riyadh for opportunities and left this mountain. And now that you are coming back because the opportunity How is about in. that? So it's everywhere. It's wow. in every corner. It's Here great. in Al-Ula, we have a lot of great stories that people are benefiting of from this amazing thing that's happening yeah. in yeah. the kingdom at the amazing. moment. It's great. Yeah. It's great. You know, being patient, getting better, uh, a little better every day, uh, you know, working with sincerity. People, a lot of people want success overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. No. Al-Ula won't... The, the, the vision won't be executed overnight. But, but look where we are now compared to four years ago. Th what about by 2025? What about by 2030? Exactly. We're going to have a different conversation. Exactly. We're going to have this conversation exactly. again. For sure. <laughs> you know, For sure to compare things, for sure. Uh, definitely. And 100%. we're moving on a fast pace that we cannot even catch up. Yeah, no, we're not. Like yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. But thank you for having me. Bibi, I really appreciate uh, uh, doing this with you. Uh, it's such an honor to sit in front of you. I, mean, well, I wish you all the best. And your podcast is one of my favorite podcasts. <laughs> Thank you. And it's the podcast that I send everybody to. Dude. Because unfortunately, there is not a lot of information on us out there. And it's a great thing to have something to send people to. Habibi, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. You are welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. It gets Except really cold, huh? I love it. It gets super cold. Thank you. 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 Thank you.